What's going on guys, Ben Brewster here, Tread Athletics. Uh, today I wanna to touch on a topic uh, which is near and dear to my heart, which is why your IDAR sucks. What I mean by IDAR is you perceive a certain velocity when you watch a video of a pitcher throwing or you watch a pitcher throwing and why that approximation, that estimation in your head is actually very unlikely to be accurate. So there have been a lot of comments on some of the videos we've been putting out that that's not the actual velocity these guys are throwing. And so I'm here to clap back at some of these comments on why your IDAR is actually a terrible gauge of velocity. And hopefully you can leave this video uh, learning something, taking something away. And even as a, from a pitcher standpoint, um, what you can use to improve your arsenal uh, based on this information. So some questions to answer. One is, why do some pitchers look like they're throwing so much harder or slower uh, than the reality, right? Why do some guys uh, go out and it looks like they're throwing slow, but they're actually coming out of the game and you're like, that was 95, that was 94. Um, but it just looks slow to the hitter, the hitters are all over that pitch. And then the opposite obviously happens as well, where it looks like the guy's throwing absolute gas, turns out he's throwing 88, 89, 90. So why does that happen? Uh, two, answer the question, why are our eyes are just, again, a terrible gauge of, of guessing this velocity um, alone? And then three, uh, maybe by the end of this, we can understand why some boomers feel the need to comment. That's 85 tops on videos of pro pitchers throwing 95, 97. So let's dive in. So an overview. Uh, one, our eyes are approximating velocity based on a number of set assumptions. We'll get into what some of these different variables are, but in general, we assume that a fastball that that has that late ride or that late jumping effect to it or that, that late carry where it explodes on the hitter or the catcher at the last second. In general, we assume that those pitches are going to be faster. Well, because in general they are. If you take a 70 mile an hour fastball and you take a 100 mile an hour fastball, one seems to explode, one seems to just kind of fizzle out and die. So we associate that riding, that carry, that, that final explosion with high velocity, just visually looking at the pitch. A fastball that fades or dies or has a little bit of sink at the very end, just kind of, you know, it doesn't have that late explosion. Generally, we're gonna associate that with a slower pitch. Because again, if you take a 70 mile an hour pitch, it's gonna be a lot more affected by gravity. It's gonna have some fade to it versus that 100 mile an hour pitch. There's gonna be a difference there. So that's kind of the assumption that we're making based on how the pitch actually finishes into the zone. So this introduces the idea of induced vertical break, which any coach out there, most pitchers who've used a rap soda or a track man understand what this is now. But if you're not familiar, induced vertical break is basically the distance between where the pitch actually crosses the front of home plate from a height standpoint and where that pitch would have crossed home plate height wise in the absence of, of spin. So if we're just looking at uh, how gravity affects that pitch on its own. So if that pitch would have dropped a certain amount and it actually has a, lot, a decent amount of backspin, maybe that pitch actually drops less than it otherwise would have if there wasn't actually that spin factor. If that pitch has a ton of topspin and it's, you would expect it to drop a certain amount, but it actually drops way more than would otherwise be anticipated, that would be an example of something like a curveball. So there's basically an average amount of what's called induced vertical break uh, in the big leagues, in the minor leagues, and at the college level. And so hitters are really used to seeing this type of fastball. And they're really used to approximating where that pitch is going to cross home plate and the height that it's gonna cross home plate uh, based on where they see the ball come out of the pitcher's hand. So any pitch that deviates drastically from that uh, and, and really holds, holds its plane better or has a ton more sink than that average dead zone fastball is gonna be a lot more difficult to hit from the hitter's standpoint. So in general, a positive number uh, is going to mean that that pitch actually dropped less than if it was impacted by gravity alone. It doesn't actually mean that the ball is legitimately rising. It just has this illusion of rising. It's dropping less uh, due to gravity than it otherwise would. Um, again, hitters are used to the dead zone fastball too. Whiff rates do increase with high vertical break. So as that number gets up, uh, pitchers that throw up in the zone with high vertical break fastballs typically get more whiffs and they have an easier time getting swings uh, below the ball, so getting above the barrel. And then the flip side as well, uh, ground ball rates increase with guys who have very low vertical break. So I think a sinker profile, a guy who has a ton of late break downwards, not necessarily gonna get as many whiffs, but they're gonna be inducing more ground balls because those hitters are gonna be swinging above the ball. So what does this all mean from a IDAR standpoint, a velocity uh, assumption standpoint? The main thing is that a pitcher with a super high carry or super high induced uh, vertical break may appear to actually be throwing harder than the reality. So 92 with a ton of carry might actually look harder than 98 with some sink. And we'll get into some examples of that in a second. A pitcher with average or low vertical break may appear to be throwing slower than reality. We've all seen examples of this. Um, so it's really impossible to, at least that I've seen, to accurately predict velocity with your eyes alone, um, especially without knowing some of the uh, the actual pitch metrics associated with, with the vertical break of that pitch. 
There are some other factors, again, uh, associated with perceived velocity besides simply the, this vertical break uh, correlation and the velocity of the pitch. One is extension. So if you're releasing the ball a lot closer to home plate, that pitch is also gonna look faster to, to an onlooker or to the hitter. Think of Raldis Chapman, he's getting way out in front of the rubber at ball release. So not only is that pitch 100 plus miles an hour, but he's also releasing it closer than the average. Uh, so that's gonna have an impact as well on how, how fast that pitch looks. Uh, a high approach angle, which we've talked about in other videos, but essentially how steep or flat of a plane that pitch keeps on its trajectory from release point to where it crosses home plate. So you can think of a high approach angle would be someone with maybe a lower arm slot that throws up in the zone. That ball is gonna keep a very steep, flat plane on its trajectory to home plate. Whereas somebody who has more of a low vertical approach angle, that might be somebody with a really high release point that throws a ton of sinkers down in the zone. And so that ball is gonna keep a really steep plane. So high vertical approach angle is a flat plane, low is a really steep plane. Okay, so this is basically a way to create a, create a rising effect independent of the actual spin on the baseball. The high vertical approach angle is gonna look like it's jumping on the hitter as well. Horizontal break, we associate a ton of arm side run and sink, again, with, with sinkers, which are typically slower than four seams. We also associate them with a change up type movement. So that can be associated with looking a little bit slower if we see a pitch that has a ton of fade, ton of arm side run. So broken up different classifications of fastball by uh, looking slower, looking faster. Again, the dead zone fastballs are gonna look slower. Uh, the high carry fastballs are gonna look faster. And then we'll touch on some examples of what I'm calling a sneaky dead zone fastball, double threat and triple threat fastball uh, to show some additional examples of how you can create this, this high, high perceived velocity effect. So take a look at this clip, watch a couple throws and just kind of think in your head, like how hard would you assume that this pitch is uh, based on your IDAR alone? So play it a couple times. All right, to me it looks firm, but doesn't necessarily look like 100 miles an hour, right? Like I might guess this is 93, 94. Uh, this pitch is actually 97 miles an hour, I believe. So Scott in this case was 95, 98 uh, in this bullpen. Uh, this is an example of what I would consider a dead zone fastball. Uh, he's right around league average, uh, MLB league average in terms of that vertical break number. So despite having high velocity, there's nothing special about the approach angle. There's nothing special about the actual fastball uh, metrics. And so it looks a little bit slower than it actually is and it actually plays down a little bit from if he were throwing with a 20 inches of vertical break. So he's right in that dead zone. It's going to look slower as, as a result. I mean, I don't know who can watch this and say that looks like 85, but uh, certainly doesn't necessarily look like 97 or 98 uh, to me at least. Another example, this is Jamison Tyone, uh, one of the guys that, that we work with. And again, just watching through this, to me, that looks like absolute gas. I mean, he's getting it way above the barrel. He's getting a, a whiff on this and it comes out, it looks really firm. I think we can all agree that looks like gas. Well, the reality here is that that's a 92.5 mile an hour fastball. He averages around 94. He has been up to you know 97 plus, but this is not a high velocity fastball. This is an average fastball in this particular clip. But because of the actual vertical break, this is 19.3 uh, inches of vert. The hitter swing under the ball. And so we actually pause that uh, right as the ball crosses home plate. You would expect if he's, if he's expecting about a 15, 16 inch vertical break fastball, and it's actually 19, you're gonna expect him to swing about one baseball below. And so you'll see the pitch gets again about one, one and a half baseballs above uh, where the hitter is anticipating that pitch to cross home plate. And so this is the power of a high, a high carry fastball is you're able to significantly get that ball above where the hitter expects it to go. And again, it looks significantly faster as well. Here's another one of our guys, Joe Ryan. Watch a couple here. Again, throwing up in the zone, getting swings under the ball. That looks pretty firm to me. I might say that's 94, 95, 96. The reality that's 93, 93.6. Uh, he sits right around that range. So again, league average uh, as far as actual fastball velocity. League average as well, as far as the, the actual metrics on the pitch the, from the vertical break standpoint. So he's averaging about 15 inches of vertical break right at league average. So how is he able to get these types of swings? How is he able to play up in the zone? And this comes down to what I'm calling the sneaky dead zone fastball. It's dead zone, but it still plays because he's got some other outlier characteristics of the pitch. Namely, he's got that low release height and he's throwing up in the zone. So that's creating this really flat vertical approach angle like we talked about before. He's actually ranked third right now this year for starting pitchers for that metric as far as highest vertical approach angle. So it still looks firm. It still looks like gas. It still has this rising effect even though it's average velo, average vertical break. So there is, again, there's more variables than you would otherwise think uh, at first glance. Another one of our guys, Clay Holmes, with the Yankees having a pretty good year. Play it again. 
I think we can all agree that's a pretty nasty pitch, but does that look like 98 miles an hour? Out of complete context, not knowing who this is, not knowing how hard he throws, like I might say that's just a nasty 92, 93 mile an hour sinker. But again, it's 98 miles an hour. Looks like it might be a little bit slower because of the sink, because it doesn't have that rising effect. Um, he averages about 6.5 inches of vertical break. So if a hitter comes in, assuming this might be 13, 14, 15, you expect them to be swinging maybe one, one and a half uh, balls above where that pitch crosses on plate. Again, we can pause this uh, right as the ball crosses on plate and you can see again, swinging above the ball. You're not gonna get high whiffs with a sinker profile, but this is still something that's gonna get a really high ground ball rate and still be very effective. So this is more of a, a sinker profile uh, where it's typically gonna look a little bit slower uh, than it actually is, but still play up. And then finishing with a couple guys that have absolutely elite fastballs. Uh, we don't work with these guys, but uh, Craig Kimbrell, we're all familiar with how hard he throws. This is, uh, I believe this is 97. You can see it holds plane extremely well, has that late jumping life to it. Uh, this is what I would consider a double threat fastball. So we've touched on some of these variables. Uh, what happens if you have multiple of these variables uh, working on your side? So he's throwing extremely hard. He's throwing above league average velocity. He's also, in this particular pitch, he's, he's throwing with high vertical break. He's 18 inches here. Uh, but in general, he's more of a dead zone guy, just like Joe Ryan. What is his main outlier characteristic is he has a negative 3.6 uh, approach angle. For, that's an extreme outlier. He's short, he's getting down the mound, he's releasing from a low slot, and he's throwing everything up in the zone with his fastball. So an extremely high approach angle, extremely high velocity. And that's really what he's made his living on is, is that outlier characteristic, despite having more of a, of a league average uh, kind of dead zone uh, vertical break on the fastball. And then here's Josh Hader. Watch that through a couple times. I mean, this looks like 100 plus miles an hour to me at least. That looks unhittable. Now, this particular one, I'm calling triple threat because he's got all three variables on his side. This is a 20.6 inch vertical break fastball, which is elite. He's at 98 miles an hour here, which is again elite. And he's got an outlier vertical approach angle which is elite. So this ball just jumps every which way you slice it. That ball is jumping on the hitter and it looks a lot harder than it actually is as a result. It's 98, but that looks like 100, 102 miles an hour, at least to me. The point is not all fastballs are actually created equal. Uh, fastballs can play up or down based on a number of factors, which we've, we've touched on now. But in general, our, our eyes are actually aren't a great predictor of velocity. That doesn't mean we can't see the, the actual rising effect or the sinking effect, right? We can see that our eyes aren't lying to us in terms of uh, the effect that's actually going on. And the hitters see that too, right? The hitters have trouble hitting these balls that rise or balls that sink way more than league average. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean we can use that to extrapolate the velocity with any real degree of accuracy. For pitchers, it's really about finding a way to avoid this dead zone fastball, right? It might be getting away from a four seam and switching to more of a sinker profile to get below the barrel. It might be tweaking the tightness of your grip, the finger width, the finger pressure, to try to find a way to, to creep that vertical break up a few inches and be able to get above the barrel and pitch up in the zone. But finding a way to do something, have some sort of outlier characteristic to where hitters aren't just teeing off on the pitch. And then finally, the next time that you see one of these comments that says that's 85 or that's not 95 um, on a video where it's not a you know, verified stalker or track man reading, send them to this video. Hopefully they can, they can learn something and uh, take that into kind of their next uh, keyboard warrior session moving forward. But uh, all that being said, guys, thanks for sticking around for this video. If you enjoyed this content, drop a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, go ahead and do so. Give this video a thumbs up and let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks again.